Hello uh, everyone, uh, thank you to attend this talk. Uh, so uh, the today topic is uh, how to uh, enable uh, Linux uh, within a safety uh, compliant architecture. So this talk was prepared by myself, uh, Philippe Arfol, CEO of uh, IoT.bzh and uh, Stéphane Desneux, or CTO. So before moving uh, further, a uh, quick introduction about ourselves. So uh, IoT.bzh is a company located in uh, Lorient, uh, an arbor city uh, located in South Brittany, a western part of France. Uh, we have a team of uh, 30 uh, Linux uh, embedded engineers and um, we have a partner in uh, the automotive sector, but also in the aeronautic and the energy. So uh, we've been working historically uh, with Renesas uh, since the creation of the company. And in fact, uh, we have to uh, send a warm thank you uh, to both uh, Isao and uh, Kurokawa who uh, have been helping us a lot. And in fact, uh, many of the topics exposed in uh, this talk were done with their support. Uh, but we also work in other industry uh, as uh, with Safran in the aeronautic or with uh, Total in the energy sector. At the end of the day, uh, both uh, the safety and uh, security requirement are pretty similar uh, in uh, those different industry. Uh, they clearly use different terminology, uh, potentially different standard, but uh, uh, the core root requirement uh, remain uh, pretty similar. Moving to uh, you know the art of this uh, topic. Um, the first thing is that, uh, you know, in order to make a complex object uh, safe and secure, uh, you have to work very hard. It's, it's not an easy task. Um, in the car industry, we clearly see uh, an exponential increasing of the complexity. Uh, a modern car today uh, can easily have uh, more than 100 million lines of code. Um, customers are requesting a shorter and shorter time to market, which means that when we had five years to do something today, we only have two or three. Uh, we get smarter hardware, uh, which is really cool because we can do more advanced things, but this also imposes a more complex software. And uh, on top of that, uh, the industry is moving uh, toward a software-defined vehicle uh, that imposes a central architecture uh, where we share uh, a lot of different uh, services within the same architecture, and this imposes to mix uh, both uh, secure and non-secure services within the same hardware. And last but not least, uh, we have a full uh, connectivity uh, and we have on the update, uh, we have remote control uh, and we also have a customer who are demanding new services, which means that we have to implement uh, things on the car even after the car went on the road, uh, which obviously was not possible with a previous version of a, a software uh, in the car. And so this is leading to more and more risk. Uh, obviously, it starts by increasing uh, the surface of attack significantly. Uh, we get more complexity in the car and we have a, a strong connectivity with the outside world. Uh, on the other hand, we also have uh, cyber criminalities that are getting smarter and smarter. And uh, a car remains a very expensive piece of equipment, so uh, it's important to uh, protect it uh, with the uh, right level uh, in order not to be attacked, uh, you know, on the first day you go on the road. Um, we have more and more advanced connectivity, as I said before. So not only we connected with uh, the cloud and the, the cloud controlled by the EOM, but uh, potentially we also uh, talk with uh, other, uh, you know, uh, services like maybe your house or, you know, some multimedia services, some uh, uh, weather forecast or, and so on. And uh, we get a quicker obsolescence of product. So people expect, you know, uh, more reactivity uh, to the market. And, uh, you know, they've been trained with their phone where they get new features every day. And so they expect more or less the same uh, type of behavior on, on their car. And this obviously leads to uh, more regulation. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the UN R155 and 156 are probably the two ones we're talking the most today because uh, they are going to be uh, enforced uh, very soon uh, in Europe and other countries. So it's a, it's a big shift move towards that uh, specification. But uh, we should not forget about uh, uh, the EU, EU uh, cybersecurity acts that impose you to maintain for the full life cycle of your uh, uh, connected object, uh, you know, to, to maintain against uh, cybersecurity risk. 
We also have some uh, national uh, protection law, like in Europe we have the uh, GPRDs that uh, impose a, a strict compliance to the privacy. Uh, and uh, we also have some more specific services, obviously, uh, coming from uh, the industry itself. So in the car industry, we clearly have the uh, you know, ISO and SAE specification for both uh, safety and security. And we should not forget that because we are connected to the cloud, we also inherit from the cloud regulations, so all the series of uh, 20,000 uh, X uh, that we also have to uh, to take in account. And uh, last but not least, uh, each uh, tier one and EOM is uh, coming with uh, its own set of specifications that you also have to take in account. So if we look for the safety standard constraints that we have to fulfill, uh, the first one on the safety start uh, standard is uh, the one uh, obviously defining uh, uh, at a general level the guideline for industry. Uh, so uh, uh, typically the EIC uh, specifications that define the SIR level from one to four. Uh, more specifically for the automotive, we have the ISO uh, 26662 uh, that defines the guideline for ASIL, uh, not forgetting that uh, we need ASIL-D for asynchronous driving. And, uh, but we have also a lot of uh, related standards that we have to take into account, like we have special uh, standards for uh, industrial communication network, we have some cybersecurity uh, specific to the vehicle on the road, uh, we have some uh, standard for you know software and programmable component and so on. And uh, depending obviously in the industry, so in, if you are in the medical sector, you also have some specific uh, specifications that come from uh, that industry. Um, and there are more to come, okay? So what we have today is only the beginning and uh, more is going to come. In the car industry, clearly uh, the hot subject today is uh, the UN uh, R uh, 155 and 156 that are going to be mandated for all new vehicles in Europe uh, starting uh, 2024. Uh, the same regulation is going to happen in all other countries, uh, Japan, South Korea, UK, uh, uh, Canada and China. They have slightly different uh, schedule and date of enforcement, but more or less uh, everyone is going to, to, to shift very, very quickly. So this is leading us to the fact that on one hand, we need to have more and more complexity. On the second hand, we have to fulfill with more and more regulation. Traditionally, uh, regulation was uh, done by uh, leveraging the V-cycle, uh, but clearly the traditional V-cycle is not applicable uh, neither to modern hardware, neither to modern software. Okay, so uh, on one hand, on the hardware side, modern hardware are just too smart to be fully predictable. Okay, uh, we have a lot of silicon-based uh, containerization features, so we we have some built-in uh, secure enclave in the hardware, but we don't really know how the isolation is done. At the same time, we have a lot of sharing. We share the CPU, we share the cache, we share the core, we share the car, the the, the RAM, we share the I/O. And uh, it's not really clear on, on, you know, what is the border on between what is isolated and what is shared. And uh, on top of that, we have a lot of optimization algorithm uh, that are hidden, uh, deeply protected by industrial property. And so at the end of the day, you don't really know what is happening within your hardware. On the software side, in theory, you should be able to control everything because most of the time you get the source code of what you're running. I say most of the time because it's not obvious you, you get it systematically, but most of the time you, you have access at least to it. But when you have 100 million lines of code, okay, it's clear that a lot of, of those lines have been written by people you don't know. They've been written long time ago and, and potentially those people retire and so they're not there to maintain the code anymore. And I just take the example of GDPC where the first release was done in, in 1987 and so you still have some code from that, that period of time. And uh, cybersecurity, you know, is clearly not compatible with a two-year certification cycle, which is another issue. With a V cycle, it's a very long process, and you need to have a lot of reactivity with cybersecurity. And uh, typically, the industry is asking you uh, a time scale of 30 to 90 days between the time a, a CVE is published and the time is corrected in production. When the reality today of the industry is more, it takes two to four years to move from uh, the time a CVE is published and the time you can put it really the push the correction in production. So which is just incompatible with, you know, the, the risk we, we have to deal today. 
And, and not only that, but we also have to maintain the code for all along product life, uh, which for the car industry clearly means more than 10 years. In fact, it's more than 15 years than 10 years that you have to maintain it. And so that's also another challenge because as today, more or less, a car was shipped with a version of software and was keeping more or less this version of software for the full life cycle of the car. So when we look for all this, uh, you know, new complexity coming in, uh, what is the response of open source project? What, what are going, you know, what people are working on? And uh, the most visible project is clearly EDISA, uh, that is uh, working on the kernel configuration and option required for safety and security. It's a very, very long road to go. There are a lot of people working in, uh, so uh, they're working pretty well, but we do not expect any result, you know, in, in the next uh, short coming time. Uh, another group that is also working pretty well is CIP. Uh, this one is really focusing on the uh, uh, critical uh, public infrastructure. Uh, it mostly focuses on cybersecurity and uh, really focus on very, very long time uh, kernel maintenance. We're talking about 20 years or more. And uh, as today, safety is not part of their scope. So they mostly focus on cybersecurity. Uh, very differently, we have a project like Zephyr. So Zephyr is not a Linux, it's a real-time operating system. We're going to talk about it later. And uh, Zephyr has done very significant project to move toward uh, the SEAL 3 uh, level of certification. Uh, they also target AZLD, uh, whether it's going to be COD is another story, for the core OS only, so not the extension. Uh, they've done pretty good work, uh, especially they rewrote a, a significant part of the code to, to comply with MISRACI and other you know, uh, documentation requirement for the certification. Um, they claim they could be ready by the end of uh, 2023. Uh, we'll see if they're going to be on time or not, but they've done a good progress. And so we're very optimistic that they're going to uh, succeed uh, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, we have other projects that have been more dormant for the past years. Uh, OSDL is one of them. Uh, they focus on, the, on safety for, uh, and security for industrial Linux, uh, but we've not seen any, uh, any significant project in the past four years. So if we're willing to go to certification, I think it's important to remember that uh, small is really beautiful to certify. Okay, So the bigger your project, the harder it is going to be to, to certify. And so one way of, of going to certification is like Elisa is trying to do, which is certifying the full Linux, or at least a, a small Linux, a reduced set of Linux, but still a full Linux. The other option, it's the option we, we took in, in our work with Renesas, is to isolate the, the safety part uh, in to a smaller operating system and in our case we selected Zephyr uh, because it's both small and recent and honestly as I said in our opinion it is the most promising uh, open source candidate. There are other candidates, FreeRTOS is one of them but the code is uh, much older and uh, we are more skeptical about this capability to go through certification. Now on the Linux side, we have a lot of legacy code and complexity. And let's be honest, Linux potentially kernel might never be certified. Maybe, you know, Elisa is going to succeed. Maybe they're going to fail. And if we look at what uh, Linus Torvald said, he said that, uh, you know, the, the Linux kernel he originally envisioned that was, you know, very small and very modular and very efficient is not what is Linux today. And each version of Linux is getting fatter and fatter, which means it's going to be harder and harder to certify. Okay, so either someone is able to do a strong cleanup on the Linux kernel or it's never going to be certified for safety. Another good candidate for uh, safety is the trust zone part. You know, in the ARM uh, architecture, we have this trust zone and in this trust zone, we can run the microkernel or real-time operating system that are also potentially small enough to get relatively easy certification. Now, on the trust zone, we have uh, one special issue. The trust zone is sharing uh, the core with Linux. So potentially, we may have some conflict between you know, Linux having some influence on, on the trust zone itself. So it might be a little harder for certification, but it's still a good candidate, and, and we've seen some project for AZLB, especially, where people are running some, you know, a loop check in the, in the trust zone. As today at IoT BZH, we consider that at least for 2022, uh, the safest option remains a full hardware isolation. 
which is running a real-time operating system in a dedicated MCU that is hosted within a modern uh, uh, SOC. Okay, and for the open source operating system, we see uh, Zephy as really the best candidate with no real competitor as today. In the commercial sector, it's very different. There are a lot of offering. Uh, Proven Core Autos are clearly in the uh, automotive industry is from far uh, the most uh, well-known uh, uh, capability uh, to do that. Now, on the cybersecurity space, on the other hand, Linux is clearly uh, leading the space. Okay, and uh, uh, Linux has a thousand of different options to implement security. And we should not forget that we cannot get safety without security. Okay, and potentially you can get security without safety, but the opposite is not true. And so when we look for the, the option we have inside Linux to implement cybersecurity, we have a lot of tools. Uh, the most well-known one clearly is a name base for container isolation with an unbind system call uh, inside the kernel. Uh, on the mandatory access control, we have SC Linux and SMAC for uh, kernel object protection. Uh, we have Cgroup for uh, resource control. We have SecCom for uh, kernel firewalling. Uh, we have the trust zone to bootstrap the initial uh, root of trust. Uh, we have the capability to implement encrypted file system. And at least on the uh, recent version of the kernel, we have eBPFs that allow us to implement directly within the kernel uh, some hook for introspection, which is very useful if you want to implement uh, intrusion detection. Um, this being said, uh, all those mechanisms might not be compliant with your hardware embedded constraints. Okay, uh, the, In the embedded world, uh, we have a limited of uh, hardware capability, so potentially your RAM, your CPU, uh, your battery is uh, very limited, and so some of those features may uh, request uh, too many uh, capability or too many uh, resources uh, to be compliant with your project. Uh, you may also uh, increase your boot time in a level that is unacceptable. This is especially true if you start to uh, crypt your file system. Uh, and also another element that you have to take into account is, unfortunately, uh, we don't start everything from a green field, but uh, we have a lot of legacy uh, software and hardware we have to take into account. And potentially, uh, those new mechanism uh, might not be uh, compatible uh, with your uh, existing software or hardware. So if you run the uh, Linux kernel version 3.x, uh, probably you're not going to use eBPF. Okay? And uh, the last element is you have to be careful that even if you're able to implement a, a, a safe and secure mechanism, uh, potentially if the complexity is too big and if you cannot implement the documentation that proves that your, your system is safe, you're never going to go through the certification. So you also have to mitigate the, the complexity that you can document in order to go through the certification. So, as I said, Linux is, is a very good candidate and clearly the best candidate for cybersecurity. It's clearly not the, the best candidate for safety. So Linux alone might not be enough for safety reason. Okay. Uh, you have also other elements, okay? For example, if you need to implement hard real time, Linux is clearly not the best candidate. If you have to do very short uh, wake up on, on data sensors, uh, if you have to safe certify, as I said before, for safety, uh, but also if you have to run uh, on battery for a very long time, for example, if you, if you have your car getting parked for six months, uh, you're not going to run Linux for six months on the battery or your battery is going to die. So you probably want to run a smaller operating system uh, that is going to check whether the battery is too low or whether the car is moving. And in case something abnormal happens, you wake up Linux and then Linux can uh, exchange data with the cloud or to notify you know, the event to the cloud. But you don't have the Linux uh, running full time just for the supervision of basic element. There are other elements where Linux is probably not the best candidate, uh, where you want to have some uh, dedicated uh, microcontroller or coprocessor, uh, video encoding is clearly one, audio processing, neural uh, computing, and so on. So there are many other elements where Linux is not the best candidate to, to really implement very specific algorithm uh, that have either uh, very uh, real-time constraints or have a strong, strong safety uh, requirement. 
The good news is that uh, new hardware uh, multiprocessing allow us to run a different operating system on the same SOC. So on top of the traditional symmetric multiprocessing that we had for quite a long time now, where we, we can run a rich operating system uh, on different core, uh, having a compatible architecture. So typically uh, a, a big uh, uh, <coughs> or little Indian on ARM uh, V8, uh, where you run, everyone is running architecture 64 bit on A57 uh, or 53. So Linux sees that as different uh, cores, but it does not see really a difference in between the different core because they are compatible. Uh, with a new generation of hardware, uh, it was introduced the capability to run very different uh, core uh, uh, within the same SOC. And so you can, for example, run a 32 bit uh, core when the rest of your architecture is in 64 bits. This is what is happening, for example, on on uh, the Renesas Arcor Gen 3, where we have a Cortex R7, so it's an ARM uh, 7, uh, when the rest of the architecture is running a, a ARM V8. So Linux is running on the ARM V8, and we run Zephyr on the, the ARM V7. So this allows us to run a multiple OS on the same SOC without an hypervisor. So depending on the hardware, you can run either, you know, a real-time operating system and then one Linux, or you may run even two Linux, uh, because you can split even the 64-bit the uh, cores. Uh, so it gives you a lot of flexibility, and you can do all of that without uh, requiring an hypervisor, which is really cool. So obviously, uh, Renesas is supporting that, but they're not the only one. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the modern hardware uh, support uh, one or multiple uh, microcontroller and hardware isolation at uh, the SOC level, whether it is NXP, uh, Xilinx, or ST architecture. So uh, clearly, uh, modern hardware is your friend. So if we uh, deep dive a little more uh, inside, uh, you know, uh, Zephyr and, and Linux on our car, uh, this is the architecture of the uh, Gen 3 uh, R car. So we have a, a ARM V7 uh, R7, which is a dual lockstep uh, processor. So it's really designed for safety. And uh, alongside, we have for Linux uh, four uh, A57 and four uh, A53. Okay, and uh, so we can run Linux and Zephyr on the same SOC. And uh, so if we look for what we have at the R7, we, we have really a fully isolated zone. So the Cortex R7 uh, is an 800 uh, real-time processor. It has some dedicated device. So for example, you can allocate the CAN device or UR device uh, to the R7 and then Linux cannot use it at all. And uh, we use OpenAMP with a hardware mailbox in, in order to exchange in between the two worlds the real-time world with Zephyr and the rich OS with Linux. And uh, this model allows you to run uh, the critical service uh, inside uh, the real-time zone where you, you really may have hard real-time constraints. You may go through certification because it's a very small operating system, so the amount of documentation you have to produce uh, remain acceptable. You potentially have very low power consumption because you can stop Linux and you can continue to run uh, the R7. Uh, and you nevertheless have a smart and standard mechanism to exchange data in between Linux and uh, real time. As I said before, in, in, in many cases, uh, you know, the real time part is going to do something uh, specific. So either because of real time constraints or because low battery constraint, and then it's going to send the result to Linux. And Linux is going to uh, compose those data, it's going to send those data to, to the cloud or is going to expose the data uh, to the end user. So it's really a collaboration in between the two operating system. And this architecture is available on, on many different uh, architecture, okay, uh, ST, NXP, Xilinx and so on. Uh, <laughs> Even if, uh, you know, most of the work we've done today inside IoT BZH is, uh, is done for uh, Renaissance boards. On the Linux side, we also have a capability to run isolation, okay? And we should not forget that it, it might not be enough for, for safety. At least it's clearly not enough for ASIL-D and not going to be anytime soon uh, enough for ASIL-D. Uh, we could argue about ASIL-B because that's a, a lower uh, requirement for safety and potentially we could we could potentially deal Linux on ASIL-B. Um, but this imposes you clearly to have a, a very clean and proper mechanism where you can define the privilege 
You can define the audit of your global security and safety. You can automatically generate uh, the rules of SC Linux for the security, but also the SecComp, the capability and the SEC group for uh, the safety. So you can guarantee that one given task has access to this limited amount of resource. Okay, so you, you can really uh, split your Linux in, in different silo to guarantee that your critical silo uh, will have enough resource uh, to fulfill what they have to do. And uh, on top of that, obviously, you have to supervise and report, okay? Because enforcing is not enough. You also have to uh, supervise and report. So Linux has a lot of, lot of different mechanisms for do that. And obviously, container is a key element for that. In IoT BZ8, we use a Red Pack uh, launcher for implementing these type of features. So introspection and report is a very important point. Obviously, uh, as techie, we mostly tend to focus on, you know, uh, the different technical element to implement either the safety or the security. But reporting is a, is a mandatory part. And if you don't do the reporting, you're never going to go through certification. So you should never forget about uh, the reporting. And uh, one key element that is mandatory is to have uh, an IDS to report inappropriate behavior. Whether we're talking about you know, safety, uh, bad behavior. For example, your system should generate 20 images per second. And if you only generate 23 images per second, you have to report that because potentially you have to stop, you know, uh, the image for uh, algorithm for recognition because it's not going to work properly with only 23 images per second. Uh, so you, you have to implement this type of mechanism and to report that. And so uh, the good thing is for kernel system introspection, we have eBPF, at least on, on recent kernel. Um, we have a lot of uh, standard and generic Linux mechanism for supervision, uh, whether it's supervision of, you know, uh, whether an IP table has been changed, uh, uh, you, you use too much memory, uh, one thread is getting crazy and so on. So we have a lot of capability to introspect the system. If you have a microservice architecture, Hopefully, you also have the capability to do introspection directly at the microservice architecture. Network censoring typically is something where Linux is very strong for introspection and log collection as well. So it's important that you collect the log, you clean that up, uh, potentially you store them locally because you don't have connectivity. And when you have connectivity, you send them to the cloud and someone in the cloud is doing the global supervision, is doing the correlation, generate new rules, generate updates, and then update your, your system in your car. So we see that anyway, even if you have something in your Linux, it's not enough. You also have stuff that happened before at the development time where you have to define the privilege, you know, the, the file rules, uh, who can do what, and, you know, the mandatory uh, access control. And uh, then at the SOC global supervision level, you also need to collect the data and you have to look for what is happening and clean your system and, uh, and update your rules and send the update to your device. And this obviously imposes you to have a, a full uh, uh, SOTA, FOTA mechanism where you can update both your software and your firmware. At IoT BZH, we use uh, Mander IO for that. So Mander is an open source project uh, done by, by a Norwegian team. It's a, it's a very nice project. And uh, uh, there are obviously other options. Uh, to be honest, in the automotive industry, uh, most of the people we talk to already have something because uh, they want to handle the, the update uh, software with uh, the fleet management. So, um, But if you have smaller system or at least for test and development, Mander IDO is clearly a, a very nice option. And uh, you want this to be integrated completely within your development chain and your CI CD uh, in such a way that uh, you, know, you produce automatically uh, the update. And uh, do not forget that if you're willing to uh, react uh, very fast, which means uh, having, you know, your update going to the car in, in 30 to 90 days, uh, you need to have a very fast and efficient model for both applying the correction, checking the correction, uh, doing the audit test, and then updating your boards. Um, another key element in the embedded is uh, the long time support. Okay, uh, the average age of a car in Europe is 11 years. Uh, a car typically is going to the to try to be trash after 20 years. Uh, for the maritime sector, it's even bigger. Or the energy sector, it's it's very common to have 30 or even longer uh, lifetime for for equipment. So it's important to to have a, a long term support on your system. Uh, if we look for the existing uh, distribution today of Linux. Uh, we clearly see that uh, outside of the main uh, IT uh, distribution, uh, whether it is uh, Ubuntu, Suzy, or Red Hat, uh, no one is uh, providing uh, 10 years or more of support. 
which is uh, probably what you want to start from, uh, especially if you want to implement 15 years. It's uh, it's important to already start with something that is uh, supported for 10 years. Uh, on the other hand, if we look for the embedded uh, targeting distributions like uh, Billroot or Yocto, uh, none of them have uh, long-term support. So, uh, in our opinion, the only way to implement long-term support uh, at an acceptable cost is by taking uh, an IT distribution and to tailor your distribution uh, to do the embedded work. It's much cheaper than doing the opposite, which is taking an embedded distribution and then try to do a long-term support on top of it. And so uh, this is sending us to uh, a kind of global architecture uh, where on, one, on, on the left part, we really want to have the safety part uh, running in a dedicated core. So uh, for this uh, slide, I took uh, the architecture of the uh, Renaissance RCAR V3U. Uh, so it's not a R7, it's a R52 that we have. So we run the fee on that. And uh, you can run on, on that uh, processor, that microcontroller, you can run all the safe and real-time parts. Uh, while on the, the uh, standard A56 uh, uh, core, you can run Linux and you can run the different silo uh, to isolate your different service on Linux. Uh, so having uh, obviously the core service of, of Linux running uh, at the global core and then have a, a strong isolation. Um, with obviously the traditional uh, isolation like the security, the firewalls, uh, the C group and so on, without forgetting the fact that you have to send all the data on the cloud and on the cloud you need to have a, a security expert that is doing a, a global analysis of the, the full fleet to potentially uh, deduct some you know a small noise attack and uh, uh, update the security rules and then push uh, through the uh, software update on the air or firmware update on the air the different modification uh, directly in the car so as a conclusion, if we, you know, uh, what can we say? Okay. Uh, as today, we don't have a, a perfect solution. Okay. And we don't have an out of the box solution, but we have many options to move toward a, a safety compliant model with open source Linux architecture. Uh, the first thing is we have a, a very strong uh, model for isolation and uh, we have, we can implement very lightweight containers. Uh, we did that at IUTBZ with Redpack. Uh, Red Hat is doing it with a uh, bubble wrap. So uh, you, you, you may implement containers that are not like the traditional Docker or LEC, very heavy container. You can implement very lightweight containers, and uh, which is really cool for the embedded world. On the safety uh, side, uh, modern hardware architecture combined with modern operating system as a fear uh, can really enable us to run a very small footprint operating system supporting very hard uh, real-time constraints. And... Uh, that are close enough of certification, so the cost of documentation is going to remain acceptable for certification. On the updates side, whether it is a FOTA or SOTA, uh, you know, if you can combine that uh, with a, a smart uh, CI/CD mechanism, and you can imply, you know, uh, the functional or security uh, correction during the full life cycle of of your system, which means more than ten years. Uh, to be honest, today, most of the people we talk to are asking us for 15 years of support. So you have to be ready to do uh, update on very, very old system. Uh, for the root of trust, uh, clearly the trust zone is your friend, uh, but you may also have some hardware secure element. Um, if possible, uh, we recommend you trying to move out of the traditional PKI uh, model, which is very heavy. Uh, there are more modern mechanisms like OpenID Connect or OS2 that can uh, enable you to implement more lightweight uh, security and authentication models that are, uh, uh, in our opinion, easier to support on, on the long run. And for the long-term support, as I said, uh, you know, first you have to rely on existing IT uh, distribution because the cost of maintaining a distribution by yourself is going to be just completely crazy. But also you have to stop to implement one version of kernel per project. Okay, I think it's very important that the uh, embedded industry understands that they have to, to stick on, on a common version of a kernel. And, and I try to push people uh, with this model at, at the maximum one version of kernel per year. Okay, if you do more than that, then something is going to be is, is really wrong inside your organization and you should work to, to fix it. And the future is going to be wonderful. Okay, the future is always wonderful. Uh, 
On the code side, uh, I think uh, Rust native support uh, with both uh, a real-time operating system like Zephi and Linux and microservice is going to help us to get rid of the C++ uh, memory uh, safety bug and I, I remind you that uh, Android uh, considers that around 70% of the highly uh, severity vulnerabilities they have is coming because of memory issue so uh, moving to a language where we don't have memory issue is really something very important. On the certification side um, as today we still have a lot of work to do, to do. As I said, today it's very common that, you know, it requires six months to two years to go through the certification process. And that is not going to comply with the cybersecurity updates that you have to do in less than 30 or, or 90 days. Uh, there are some promising work uh, ongoing. Uh, and uh, I recommend you to have a check on OSCAL, which is uh, uh, from the NIST. It's uh, an open uh, security control assessment language. And uh, the idea behind it is that you should be able to, to define through this language uh, functional behavior of your system and then to test it automatically, which means that, you know, in the ideal world, we could fulfill automatically the certification documentation. On the uh, introspection side, and uh, especially the IDS, uh, we cannot use the existing uh, IDS as they are, as they're just far too heavy for the embedded world but it's still possible to skim them down and uh, to bake something that is acceptable for the embedded system. On the integrity, uh, as today, obviously, we already have the Mverity that enable us to implement uh, integrity of the file system, but we still have to work to implement some things that uh, enable us to have a, a partial update and especially per package update uh, while keeping the integrity. And so we need to have a full automation uh, from the software factory to the production of the integrity, uh, which today is not really uh, done. On the privacy, uh, that's a place where the embedded world have a lot of work to do. And as I said, in Europe, it's a very strong enforcement for privacy uh, with the GPRD. So we, we clearly have to take care of that. Uh, I think most of the file system are going to be encrypted, uh, potentially fully encrypted, at least for the early day. But on the long run, uh, we want to have per application or even per user encryption because we want to guarantee that you know one user cannot read the data of the other user uh, so this requires a lot of uh, you know tuning uh, and potentially uh, we have to check how much this is going to impact the boot time of the system i i think we have uh, the low level capability inside linux but uh, you know the full integration is not done uh, as today so uh, thank you for your time uh, if you have any question, uh, uh, Stefan is going to be more than happy to respond to them. Uh, I also added you a few pointers uh, on the source code of uh, the different uh, elements I talked about, but also the software factories that we have where you can uh, start playing, you know, uh, with the different uh, tools uh, with the Renaissance board or, you know, other board uh, that we support. Uh, as well as a uh, you know a bunch of articles, including uh, this presentation and this documentation that you may find on our website. Thank you for your time, and uh, we are ready to answer to your question.